Okay, hello everyone. Um, I hope everyone is hearing me okay. Um, so welcome to our second Reimagining Rivers webinar hosted by the Center for Constitutional Studies at the University of Alberta and the Environmental Law Center. My name is Rebecca Macias Jimenez. Um, I am, I just defended my PhD at the University of Victoria, um, looking at issues of infrastructure, um, decision making, uh, especially hydropower and the impacts on indigenous peoples in Brazil and Canada. So I'm very much looking forward to this discussion. Um, it's such an important um, a discussion regarding jurisdictions of indigenous peoples over their traditional territories. Um, so I am speaking today from the territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples and the Songhees and Squimalds. Esquimalt and Wasanich people um, whose traditional relationship with this land continues to this day. Uh, so it's known um, as Victoria, Victoria uh, BC. Um, and as this webinar, uh, many of our audience members are watching from across Canada uh, or other parts of the world. Um, I invite you to reflect upon the land where you are located today and acknowledge the, the land and the traditional people that um, occupy this land. Um, so the Center for Constitutional Studies is located at the University of Alberta in Edmonton on Treaty 6 territory. And the center acknowledges and honors the ancestors, traditions and the spirit that first drew indigenous peoples, the Cree, the Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota, Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Soto, Soto, Inuit, and then settlers to this gathering place. In acknowledging the territory we're on, we also recognize the ongoing acts of settlement and colonization that take place on this territory until today. The center, the university, and the city enjoy the benefits of Treaty 6. The center is committed to the spirit and the intent of the treaty to maintain us in a stronger and lasting relationship. So we recognize that land acknowledgement is a very small step in recognizing and upholding Treaty 6, but it's still an important one. Uh, so before I introduce the speakers and the format, uh, the format for the webinar today is as follow. Uh, first, please note that the chat function is, is going to be disabled during the discussion. Um, and your questions can be um, inserted in the Q&A um, button. Uh, so questions will appear to us in order uh, that they're being asked. Um, and if you wish to remain anonymous, you can do so um, by, um, you have that option in the Q&A uh, feature. So for this webinar, the format will be a mix of presentations and discussions, um, followed by your questions, so the audience question. So after I finish introductions, our speakers will present each one for about 20 to 25 minutes. Um, then we will have a brief discussion and we will open up for questions from the audience. Uh, we may not be able to answer all the questions. Um, I believe we are uh, 124 now uh, and I imagine there are lots of questions, uh, but please ask your questions. They, they will answer as many as possible. Um, and hopefully in the future, we can continue this discussion in another format. Um, also note that we have a short feedback form, a survey after the presentation. So we would appreciate it if you could please um, answer to that survey. Um, it would help us um, improve and work on uh, other uh, webinars in the future. Um, so um, I would, without further ado, um, I would like to introduce um, Terry Lynn and um, 
Darcy. Um, just a little second here. I need to open my... Well, you thought I would be prepared <laughs> with your bios ready, but um, I'm so sorry. Just a second here. They're really long bios, so I, I they know are I really. Right <laughs> um, okay, I'd like to introduce Terry Lynn. Um, Terry Lynn, it's she's a citizen of the Haida Nation and also the General Council. Um, she has practiced in the area of indigenous environmental law since she was called to the BC Bar in 1996. She has represented the Haida Nation at all levels of court, including the Supreme Court of Canada in the Haida case. She's lead counsel for the Haida Nation's indigenous title case, as well as the related reconciliation negotiations, which have resulted in innovative agreements with British Columbia and Canada. Terry Lynn was the founding executive director of the charity Eagle Environmental Aboriginal Guardianship Through Law and Education and has served in the past as an advisory council member for the Vancouver Foundation's Environment Program, a past ju juror for the Echo Trust US Buffett Award for Indigenous Leadership and a past board member of Echo Trust Canada. She's an honorary director of Echo Justice a board member of the Haida Gwaii Singers Society and a partner with Raven Calling Productions. In 2014, she was honored with Andrew Thompson Award for Environmental Advocacy. And in 2018, the Courage in Law Award from the Indigenous Law Students Association at the UBC Allard Law School. Terry Lynn was awarded Canadian Lawyers Top 25 Most Influential Lawyers of 2020 in the category of Changemakers. And in 2021, she ranked number 21 on McLean's Power List, um, which recognizes 50 Canadians who are breaking ground in their field. She's also a multi-award winning performer and an artist, dancer, and author. So I'm looking forward to hearing from Terry Lynn also how her artistic um, life relates to the issues that we'll be discussing today. Um, and I'm gonna find here Darcy. Although I know um, Darcy really well for some time now, we, um, we, are from the same cohort in our grad um, program, but I'd like to read from his bio. Uh, Darcy joined the Faculty of Law uh, at University of Alberta as an assistant professor in 2019. His current doctoral research, which he completed, focuses on the constitutional and legal theory of Plains Cree peoples in relation to the land, water and animals, and the trans-systemic relationships with Canadian constitutional law. Darcy earned his LLM and PhD at the University of Victoria. His thesis explored Cree legal orders through an examination of ceremonial rules of procedure and the transformation of gendered protocols. He has published and has publications forthcoming regarding indigenous law and legal theory Plains Cree constitutionalism and food sovereignty and indigenous citizenship orders. Um, Darcy, who is mixed rooted Plains Cree, was called to the BC and Yukon bars in 2012. He practiced with Davis LLP in the Yukon territory. He also has been involved in indigenous focused youth leadership development in Alberta for the past 15 years. So thank you, Darcy and Terry Lynn, um, for being here today and for being so generous with your time. 
Um, so without further ado, I turn the word uh, to Terry Lynn um, and very much looking forward to this discussion. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Rebecca, I'm honored to be here today to speak with speak with both of you and have a discussion later and to explore this important topic. I am speaking to you from the beautiful green territory. It's a pocket of green in the middle of this urban landscape here, the Semiamo First Nation. And uh, I'm really honored to, to uh, live and work on their territory when I am not in my territory of Haida Gwaii. Now I'm going to start uh, with sharing my um, PowerPoint and bear with me a minute. All right. So I'm going to quickly do an overview of um, uh, constitutions and Indigenous rights, but focusing on the Haida Constitution, I will introduce Haida Gwaii and Haida Oceans, then talk about the Haida conception of supernatural oceans, and then the Haida worldview, and then conclude about the issue that we're interested in today, which is legal personhood, but from a Haida perspective. So constitutions are said to represent the national soul of the country. And we know, unfortunately, in the last few weeks that the nature of the historic soul of this country was revealed with the 215 Indigenous children at the former, former Kalamazoo Indian Residential School. Unfortunately, those same roots that ground that um, the history of those children is also reflected in the legal system and in, our, in Canada's relationship with Indigenous peoples. And I want to illustrate that with the case study from Haida Gwaii. The Haida Nation uh, is governed through uh, an organization called the Council, the Council of the Haida Nation. It was formed in 1974 to settle land claims. The Haida people realized that the band councils had their hands full with dealing with social and other issues and they needed an overarching government that would uh, integrate all of the various forms of traditional and band council governance to advance land claims. The territory is the entire land uh, islands of Haida Gwaii and also spans into Southeast Alaska. The Council of the Haida Nation is not a band council, tribal council, society, corporation, and is not even a legal entity in Canadian law. Rather, we formed a new form of governance that represents all Haida citizens, including those that do not have status under the Indian Act. Haida sovereignty and authority is derived directly from Haida Gwaii. It's hardwired into the Constitution. The overriding constitutional mandate is to steward Haida Gwaii for future generations while striving for the full independence and sovereignty of the Haida Nation. We've taken many interim steps towards fulfilling that mandate and I'll quickly review those. So Haida Gwaii is 100,000 hectares, 99.84% of the land base is allocated to third parties by the provincial and federal governments. Only 0.16% of that land base is in Indian reserve status. That 0.16% is the extent of recognition on the part of the crown of Haida title and um, sovereignty. The current status is that Still, 100% of the land base is not in Haida title uh, and is not recognized as such, but yet we are collaboratively managing 100% of the land base. 52% of the land base is protected. It's shown in lime green here. And 25%, um, this portion here, is collaboratively managed with the government of Canada since the 1980s. It includes the surrounding ocean areas. Uh, there are also other ocean areas near, so, near shore and foreshore collaboratively managed with the government of British Columbia. All of these little veins throughout the whole landscape are uh, the riparian fish forest areas, areas that we recognize. These are rivers and ephemeral streams that are important to maintaining the salmon population in Haida Gwaii. As I said, portions of the area are collaboratively managed. We've protected 72% of the shoreline of Haida Gwaii. Um, this is all without concluding our Aboriginal title lawsuit or even negotiating a comprehensive treaty or some form of recognition of Haida title and rights. The most challenging area for collaborative management, given that we're collaboratively managing 100% of the land base is the ocean part of our territory. And that's what I'll focus on today in my case study. So the oceans are um, 
can be seen as Marinalias. It's the last colonial frontier here on the coast. Colonial and federal legislation and policies dispossess Indigenous peoples of fisheries at law. I refer you to the work of Doug Harris um, and his investigation of that. Those laws dispossessed and replace Indigenous conceptions and management of marine spaces to clear the way for over exploitation of the marine environment. Several species are fully exploited to over exploited here on the coast. Haida Gwaii has two of the 10 top commercial fishing grounds in British Columbia and has a significant state share of all other fisheries on the coast. Globally, we know that marine spaces are increasingly critical to the survival of all marine species, including human, uh, as well as the economy and our existence. Over 90% of the world's marine fish stocks are fully exploited, overexploited, or depleted. Uh, the UN has recently said our future will be determined by the state of the oceans. And then there are many, the, many other human activities, including the exploitation of hydrocarbons that further degrade ocean health, and then pathogenic marine bacteria that impact our food safety. Haida Gwaii's oceans. Haida Gwaii sits on a narrow edge of the continental shelf. It's carefully balanced next to the abyssal ocean depths, just a complete drop off on the west side of Haida Gwaii. It endures the most energetic waves climates in North America, and it's in a transition zone of ocean currents that carry very rich nutrient and plankton rich surface water to the waters of Haida Gwaii, and therefore is an important breeding ground for many, many species. It is said to contain some of the richest marine environments on the planet. My father was a fisherman and he often told stories of uh, fishing with his friends and only being able to see the tips of the fishing poles of the boats in front of him because the swells were over 30 feet tall. So it is an incredible uh, space, space to go into. Shorelines, I mentioned that we protected 72% of the shorelines. They're really important because they're an indicator of the health of the oceans. Haida Gwaii has very diverse nearshore and shoreline areas that also provide really important habitat for marine species and birds. Um, there's a, a, an incredible abundance of marine life as is evidenced by the long history of Haida coexistence with these oceans. Uh, the Haida have done great work in documenting the seasonal round of oceans. Because we are an island population, uh, we, our main sustenance source is the oceans. It's not terrestrial game. Anywhere in Haida Gwaii, you will find yourself within 20 kilometers of the ocean. So oceans are everywhere and you feel their power and that power and pervasiveness has created a culture of abundance. We harvest about 150 marine species throughout Haida Gwaii. Interestingly, we also harvest 150 plants and there are 150 islands to Haida Gwaii. I don't know what the creator was doing counting, but uh, everything aligns with those numbers. The elders uh, recently told me that our food is our medicine. So all of these 150 marine species are our medicines for our continued survival. So turning to the next topic of supernatural oceans, Despite the laws that have sought to displace us, our interconnectedness with oceans has endured. They define our culture, our identity, and our laws, and we're inextricably linked to marine spaces and marine species. Haida laws and indeed indigenous laws up and down this coast of BC are, are encoded in oceans. In our ancient narratives, Haida peoples originate from the oceans through supernatural beings such as foam women who nursed and brought to life all of the Haida people who are from the Raven clan. The greatest supernatural being is Tangwan, the one in the sea, and this supernatural being owns all of the sable fish, and everything that we put into the ocean goes into the home of Tangwan. The sacred realm requires that we uphold the laws of respect and reciprocity, and we do that through making offerings of cedar bark and flicker feathers to the supernatural beings that inhabit the marine spaces. Oceans also in the narrative are described as a place for knowledge and ceremonies. So in the narratives, we learned and obtained fire from, this, from the ocean peoples. We learned cedar bark ceremonies. 
we learned about uh, how to construct totem poles and uh, our houses from the ocean peoples. In all of the narratives, shamans are interconnected with the ocean peoples and the greatest shamans are those that get their power from the oceans. Oceans are a portal for transformation. Often in the narratives, if someone has committed a transgression against others, they will go to the oceans for retribution. And it is there that they will go through a transformation to return to being a contributing member of the society. As I mentioned, the uh, oceans are a source for knowledge, for how to fish, for how to weave, and all of the ceremonies that make up Haida culture. Uh, interestingly, we have convergence with the Kilowells and the oceans. Haida Gwaii itself is critical habitat for the northern resident orcas, which many of you may know are in a precarious state today. The Haida word for supernatural beings is Skanagwa, and the Haida word for orca is Skana, so they share the same root word. When the supernatural beings appear in the human realm, they appear wearing the skin of orcas. Also the winds, which are really important on Haida Gwaii because we often face hurricane force winds. Uh, the winds appear as supernatural beings who are represented as orcas. And I'll show you a, a photo of that in, in another slide. There is convergence between the Haida people and the orca in that the orcas have both eagle and raven clans just as Haida people do. And they also have parallel occupation of Haida Gwaii. So below every village is an orca village. And if it's an eagle village, then it's also an eagle orca town in the undersea world. Challenges, of course, are recognition of Haida title to marine spaces and indigenous title to marine spaces worldwide. Um, while we're making a little bit of headway with recognition of indigenous title and jurisdiction to terrestrial spaces and waters, uh, ocean spaces lag far behind recognition of uh, indigenous title to ocean spaces. This is an image of the southeast wind that Robert Davidson created. Uh, southeast wind is the most powerful wind to blow on Haida Gwaii and uh, southeast wind has 10 brothers and sisters who also appear as different forms of kilowells. Um, there is interconnectedness between the land and sea. Elder Diane Brown Guaganat teaches that every species on the land has a corresponding species in the water and that they are cousins. The ocean, the Haida worldview recognizes uh, in a very integral way, the Haida law of balance. And I'll show that in my next slide. And that law itself ideally situates long-term sustainable management of the human use of the oceans. This whole worldview aligns with the current trend of legal personhood, but prescribes a different approach than uh, might be taken in other places. This is an image that illustrates the Haida conception of ocean spaces and the Haida worldview. These are the towns of the ocean peoples and the Kilowells. They are below the towns in, of Haida Gwaii. Um, the Kilowells have subterranean avenues of approach into the villages that are far inland. When they appear in our world, as I said, they wear the skins of Kilowells. The entirety of Haida Gwaii is supported by a pole that rests on the chests of Kuya Gagandals. Kuya Gagandals is a supernatural being that didn't lose, but in fact won the battle for who would have the privilege of holding up Haida Gwaii. This is a very precarious existence. At any time there is an earthquake, this a little Martin runs up and down the pole, which causes the land to shift and causes an earthquake. The Haida word for responsibility is lagu ga kanthlins, and it means chest leaning on it. And it really means that responsibilities are felt on the chest and in the heart because of the supernatural being Kuya Gagandals. So in addition to Kuya Gagandals, the Haida worldview sees supernatural beings that are caretakers of different places that we go to harvest on Haida Gwaii. So Chi Hu Jin Jat is low tide woman, and she is the caretaker of all the shellfish and beings and the food in the intertidal areas before we take any clams or octopus or any of the beings that live in the ocean realm, we must seek her permission and we must pay respect and give offerings to low tide woman. 
She teaches us that the ocean spaces is a feminine realm that warrants stewarding, and she demonstrates that through her conduct. Similarly, there is a supernatural being that is a caretaker of every river and creek in Haida Gwaii. She is called Kandlai Jat, or literally creek woman or woman at the head of the river. She takes care of the salmon and trout that return. Um, she also demonstrates respect and how to engage in respectful uh, interrelationship with the land. Uh, often in these rivers in Haida Gwaii, you will find black bears. They leave the carcasses in the oceans. I think they're leave making offerings to Creek women to take the salmon. And those in turn, those carcasses of the salmon create the incredible rainforests that are known here on the coast. With that worldview, we've, we have successfully integrated our main Haida laws into management of the human use of Haida Gwaii with both the federal and provincial governments. These are the laws of respect, responsibility that I spoke about, interconnectedness that I also spoke about, balance as demonstrated by Kuya Gagendals, seeking wise counsel, in, uh, and that is seeking the advice of environmentalists and uh, the settler populations on Haida Gwaii, and then also giving and receiving and reciprocity. Now, in conclusion, I, um, it's my view that the tarnished national soul of this country must reflect Indigenous rights and title. It must reflect sovereignty and jurisdiction. That is the message from the 215 children that we um, have just learned, the country has just learned about, we've known about for a long time. This country must also reflect Indigenous laws and their application to the management of the human use of the environment and rivers. And it must reflect the Indigenous conceptions of territories like the Haida worldview of Haida Gwaii. Legal personhood is one tool, but given the history of this country, it must not be done in a way that displaces Indigenous sovereignty and in a way that prevents us from fulfilling our inherent responsibilities to take care of territories, including rivers. So I wouldn't want personhood to be a block to our sovereignty and our responsibilities to take care of rivers. For the Haida Nation, legal personhood would not vest in the land the rivers or the oceans per se, but rather in the supernatural beings that Haida narratives ascribe as caretakers of those realms. So I believe I'm out of time and thank you for listening and look forward to hearing Darcy in our discussion later. Thank you, Hawa. Thank you so much, Terry Lane. That was amazing. I really um, enjoyed the, your, uh, mentioning that responsibility, we feel we feel it in the heart and on the chest. That's that's really beautiful. It's all about um, relationship, right, with the the natural world, and uh, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. So, um, without without further ado, I will um, turn it to Darcy, um, and then we will have a discussion after his presentation. Thank you so much, Darcy. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, Terry Lynn. I'm oh, just so grateful to be able to hear you speak and to learn from you. And that last slide, when you talk about um, a path forward, so to speak, I think there's not only non-Indigenous communities, but um, Indigenous nations have much to learn from the sharing of the Haida Nation on, on these things. And so really grateful for being able to hear you speak again. And um, I got a slideshow I'm gonna pull up here. And um, so I'm, I'm uh, going to center my talk um, where I am now. So I'm in a Muskwichi, Waskahegan. I'm in Edmonton. Um, I'm in a basement suite, so not in a forest of green, uh, but there is a green lawn out there around me. And this might be my last presentation from this basement. Uh, so, um, so I'm excited about that as well. Um, but it actually fits in with with what I'm going to talk about here, because I'm really going to talk about our relationships to our lands and waterscapes. And we talk about um, what I'm encompassed here as Eski, and how that informs um, when we start to think about ideas of jurisdiction. And so um, I'm gonna, I like the way Terry Lynn talked about legal personhood in a different orientation. And when I think about even jurisdiction, um, 
what I talk about is there's some similarities when we think about it, but I'm actually going to share some stories that are going to shift the way we think about jurisdiction. Um, we have a different history here um, as Plains Cree peoples with um, historic treaties, most likely most um, poignantly Treaty 6, and um, quite the fracturing of um, our peoplehood across uh, the prairies here, which has made our revitalization efforts being really um, different, um, so to speak here. And so I'm gonna work through that here in this, this presentation. Um, but I wanted to start with, um, with a story here. I'm gonna, and I'm gonna tell this pretty quickly. And so um, when we think about this, I, I too just love that image that you shared Terry Lynn about um, the beam and, and obligation coming from the chest as well. And we, I think about this, we have a, a Plains Cree story that I'll share really quickly here about um, Buffalo Lake. And we have this word, our word for water in, in, in the Heowian is Nipi, um, which uh, we talk about water is life. It's the center of our, our beings. And, and it actually is within our language, that sort of epistemology of this word, or etymology of this word, um, is nia, which means uh, nia, if I was to say nia pematsuin, it, I'd be saying I am life, right? And when you look at the, the root of both those words, um, nipi, that's where the word water comes from. And so our older ones in our communities talk about this. They talk about this as not just a cool thing to say, but it's a teaching, right? That they're trying to teach us this. And so I was told this story by my older brother when I was about seven or eight, I can't recall when it was, but it's the story of Buffalo Lake. And this is an, this is the lake in central Alberta, and it's the creation of this. And I'll share it quickly here. Um, is there was a time when when Mustus, that's a buffalo, was disappearing from the prairies, and which was a keystone relationship, um, especially in terms of nourishment for for us for Nahiel peoples, and. So a hunter went into ceremony for four days. That's an important part of this story, even though I'm, I'm rushing over it. On the fourth night, saw this vision of where this buffalo would be, this mustus. Um, so set off with a, with a helper, journeyed for four days along the prairie in really harsh conditions because it was kind of a drought. Um, but on four days came upon this, this place that they saw in the stream and there was a buffalo there. Um, and so being a really gifted hunter was able to spear this buffalo with a bow and it, um, the buffalo, as the story goes, took off running across the prairie. And so they had to follow, they had to track this buffalo for four days um, beyond that. Um, and finally, when they got to the, um, to where after four days where this buffalo had fallen, they pulled this, the, the spear out of this buffalo and instead of blood coming out, actually water started pouring out is, is the story. So they watched this for a bit and it formed this, this pond around this buffalo. And then the hunter had to go back and get the rest of the community because they know they needed this nourishment. And so went back and got them. That took another four days. And so um, I like when you talked about 150, uh, Terry Lynn, and, and in our stories, we talk about four. This, this, these numbers are really important for us as well. Um, so I was told this, there's four separate four day journeys in this. And when they got back to it, what they saw was this, this lake that was the shape of a buffalo. Um, over top here. And so these are actually two pictures of this lake. The, for the one on the bottom left is from the shores. And then the top one, you can actually see it is the shape of this buffalo, right? This is the origin story of this lake. And what occurred was that this lake actually gave life to, um, to the peoples when they needed it. So they asked for buffalo in these ceremonies, nourishment that way. And what was provided to them was this, this life-giving water. Um, so it's a really important thing that I often think about the story. Um, so there's a second part to the story uh, where there's a transgression against them, the life of a buffalo um, and what ends up happening, I won't tell the whole part of the story here is that some people actually fall into the lake. Um, and that's kind of like the second part of the story. And I was told it when I was young and I thought it was like a ghost story. I thought it was like, oh, this is why you don't do this um, because you could hear people at night they say on this lake. Um, but as I got older, I understood like that idea of balance and reciprocity and the gift that was given to this lake and then what was taught when we transgressed that as well. And so, um, so I wanted to center the rest of my time here with that story because I am going to get a little theoretical here on this. And, and so, so you can see this, this is at Buffalo Lake. One of the stories that we have about it now is that it's been um, 
colonization has changed the relationship. So like, as you can see in the picture there, there's the postage stamped prairies around that has really harmed not only access to the waters, but also the waters themselves. Um, there's a lot of agricultural runoff. Um, it was a heavy fishing ground and it's no longer still those things as well. And so I'll introduce that part of the story as we get further along here. So really what I what I I'd like using this story to center how we think about our Eski Wiwasa Wawina, which is one way to say earth laws. Um, so our word in Cree for Eski, um, as I mentioned, um, it could mean ground, it can mean dirt, um, but we can also think about it as land and we could think about it in a jurisdictional sense as territory as well. So it's got this, this flowing meaning, this, this way we can bundle a meaning into the word. And then our word for laws, Wiwasa Wawina, um, or that's the pluralization of it, that laws. And I've been told I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a, a small learner of our language and, and I've been told by older people that the literal translation of this is the act of weaving or bringing things together. And so what it's saying is that we're not just, you know, a hierarchical society, peoples with the laws that are coming from what we talk about as our ogimals, our, our leaders, our chiefs, but actually it takes us bringing in a bunch of things to make our, our legal tradition to work together and to have that strength. And so that story I told you, um, we have this term, we'll go to win, which is our legal principle about how we govern our relationships together. That story, as I grew older, I understood it was talking about our relationships, not only to the waters of that lake, but also to, um, to Buffalo peoples as well. And so um, much like, um, obviously a different legal tradition, but um, when we think about our jurisdiction, um, you heard Terry Lynn talk about it from the Haida perspective about that obligation, of, of, of holding something up. When we think about jurisdiction, it doesn't give us rights um, from a Plains Cree perspective to the land, but actually obligations to a go to one. And so when you think about jurisdiction, it's not just um, a barrier or a delineation of a landscape, but it's how are we inuring our, our relationship and, and continuing to stitch our, our lives with the land. Um, so a go to one is it really centers how we think about a uh, ecological relationship, you can think about it as ecological um, governance on the lands here as well. And so here, this is just the Cree dialects, by the way, I just wanted to show you the, the expansiveness of Cree peoples across Canada. I'm really talking about Plains Cree perspectives. So you can see it's kind of the dark green, but it's just the language. Um, we actually have our, um, our woodland Cree or um, bush Cree as the older people call them, um, uh, relatives are kind of like the Northern dark green there as well. So really it's Southern central Saskatchewan in Alberta is what we talk about Nehiao Aski, Plains Cree territory. Uh, here. And so um, what I was interested in in my work was really how do I start to use our, our sort of legal theory of reading things together and to think about how we can revitalize our, um, our earth laws. And so I looked at four areas. I looked at our stories. I looked at our language. I looked at our um, ceremonies. Um, and I um, looked at our territoriality and I found a way to think about this and move things together. And so uh, I'll work through these really quick here. When we think about Plains Cree territoriality, um, our jurisdiction, it involves what I, I've seen is, is it's not just showing up and um, asserting an authority over the land, that sort of um, dominant view of um, jurisdiction that we see that flows from um, from Canada, but also those European traditions, but it actually involved a place making process. So that story that I told you is one of those stories where there's asking for some sort of gift to benefit the nourishment of people, showing up to a land and then the setting out of obligations on, on, on different territories. So we actually have different stories for different areas here. This actually is a picture of a stone. It's called Mistassini, which means um, um, big stone. Um, and it, it accompanied with this is a story about um, Buffalo Child um, that sets out a relationship with Mustos with Buffalo as well. And so if you actually look across Plains Cree territory, there's stories that really set out obligations that we have to particular territories there as well. And so this is one of them. Um, and what you look in there, if you understand what Gotwin, you can start to see um, human and non-human beings and things as, as, as forming a relationship generally fostered by acts of support that are really integral to 
this jurisdiction. Um, and as part of this, so this goes back to um, the central focus of this talk and, and, and the last one in this series as well, is really thinking about the animacy of the land and what that means for our, our relationships um, with non-human um, beings and things at law. And then finally, um, it seems um, simple, um, but we have a legal principle of visiting, it's Kyogawin. And what that means is we're continuing our relationship with the land. And so, so part of our jurisdiction is going out onto the land and visiting a place and to understanding those stories, but also to feel them, to like to touch these stones, to walk on those prairies is really important. And so I share this with this picture here because actually this stone now is underwater. It's under Lake Deepneed because what occurred was the um, census was dammed up and it formed this, this man-made basin there that this rock is under. And so the ability to actually visit these places is impacted by um, the colonization of um, Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, and then language forms an important part of this law. Um, I, uh, it's a, it required, we were required a linguistic approach when we think about the revitalization of our laws. Um, and within our language um, is this the recognition of the anim animacy of lands and waters. So um, Plains Cree, um, the Plains Cree dialect of Cree is, um, it's a highly um, active language. Um, it, it's, it has a lot of verbs. I believe the 70% are verbs in, in there. And so when we start to use our language, we start to see things that are inanimate and come from a, um, a Canadian state um, way of thinking of a legal order are actually animate in the, in the language, Plains Creek. And so we, we see that kind of flow there as well. Um, and then also bundling is an important uh, method as well. And so how can I describe this? When I mention that term, Huagotawin, some of you might've heard that, especially if you're in Alberta here, it's a, it's a, it's a term that's really being revitalized. But um, like all legal principles, it needs to be filled with meaning, right? And so older ones actually talk about Wagotawin as involving that, you know, the act of hunting animals is Wagotawin because you're out there taking a life. And what does that mean? You're doing that sort of hard work of relating, right? Because there's that, that contrasting question of what does it mean? To be in relationship and kinship with an animal, you're also taking its life, right? And and so when we're we're bundling um, these experiences into that word, it gives a more fuller aspect of our, our legal traditions. By the way, this is a picture of my son Iskateo, and that's in syllabics, Cree syllabics, Iskateo as well. Here, there's an art park here in Edmonton. So um, that was probably a year and a half ago. So he's he's grown uh, from that picture. And then our stories, right? So I've, I've shared our stories. Um, our, chim, our chimawina is our, our word in the language for them. And um, I probably may be a little too um, academic, um, but uh, I look at these as like really having comprehensive intellectual um, uh, um, weight to them, right? They, they've recorded our legal pedagogy and our legal theory, if we can think in that way. Um, the way that um, my elders would say, they would say it's just a way of being, right? And another way to think about it is philosophy or, or, or um, uh, there. But that sort of language is interchangeable. Um, and what they do is they often, our stories are, they're meant to entertain us. They are meant to capture our imaginations. But also they're meant to draw us to these, these, these hard questions when we think about what is the purpose of law, right? And, and so one is this story about that, that story of Buffalo Stone that I mentioned here. Um, in that story, there's a child who's raised by both humans and buffalo and has to think about what it means to have one part of his family hunting the other. And so that, that, that story takes us to those really hard um, questions about ecological management and governments, right? Um, so it offers an invitation into that sort of legal ordering. And um, what it also does, it gives, it provides a critical philosophy on we think about law and authority. So again, how these stories think about obligations instead of thinking about this is your land, it, it, it moves us towards that sort of relational orientation of law rather than being something positive where I'm on this territory, so this is mine, right? Yeah. So again, another personal picture, that's my dog, Musqua. Um, and that's actually Buffalo Lake, uh, this, the, the story that I told you about earlier. And he's out venturing on the lake, which you're not supposed to, according to that story. So I had to call him back in. Um, and then finally, I looked at our, our, our ceremonies. 
And what I looked at this is this is a really important part of our legal pedagogy. And what this has to do with jurisdiction is that we have a cyclical nature of our ceremonial practices historically, that we had actually ventured out onto our territory and we'd have ceremonies at certain places. Um, and it was a way of visiting, but also kind of enacting our relationships to continue on. So that Buffalo stone that I mentioned, that picture in the past, that was actually a long um, standing gathering place for a number of indigenous nations. So it was a place of um, historical treaty making, of legal relations. We entered into alliances with other nations um, there. Um, we had a long standing relationship with the Nitsitapi, the Blackfoot peoples. Um, and we'd iron out disagreements there as well. And so this picture here is a, it's another area. Um, this is um, a rib stone. And what this is historically, um, Plains Cree peoples um, carved um, these stones to, in the shape of buffalo ribs. That's what this looks like. And um, it's a way to create a place for ceremony to renew the relationship with, with buffalo. And so that was part of it. And so this is one of the few that still exists um, that um, fortunately has been protected here in Alberta. And I didn't take pictures um, because around this stone, there's actually a lot of our sort of ceremonial practices. So there's prayer flags and people have left offerings here as well. And I, um, it's against my protocols to take pictures of those. I wanted to show you this stone. And what this is, this is actually Ribstone Hill, it's called in, in central Alberta here. And it's one of the higher points in the land um, in Alberta. People from other provinces will laugh when we talk about these as hills. Um, but it's a way that you would go up and you'd be able to see a very long distance here. And we, I could show you a map where we could actually see numerous hills with that um, have important um, sort of historic significance uh, like Ribstone Hill, really close to it is Flagstaff Hill where there's a bunch of prayer flags that have been historically put there. Um, this picture behind my shoulder is where um, we have this uh, uh, Papamau Asini. It's, a, it's called Flying Stone. It was a meteorite came to the earth and it was a gathering place as well. So there's another hill that's in this area and you can actually see a territory between Plains Cree and Blackfoot people set out by these different hills. Another one is neutral hills that's in these areas where um, there's a story that the hills were created overnight just so we wouldn't have violence between um, Plains Cree and Blackfoot peoples as well. And so you could start to see the idea of these ceremonies and stories as being really important to what we think about territory, jurisdiction, and obligations to other nations in those as well. Okay. Um, how am I doing for time, Rebecca? I think I've I got a couple minutes. Sorry. I, I think you're okay, Darcy. You okay, go got, I'll, I'll wrap up. Five more time. minutes is fine. Yeah. I'll, I'll get two more minutes here. I'm starting to sound myself getting long-winded. So. Um, so where is the story gone? Well, it's been the treaty relationship, right? And, and so here, um, really devastating to our ecological relationships. Um, the bottom is... Um, uh, this pile of bones of buffalo skulls that is being shipped to, um, to China to make China, um, like plates and stuff, but also um, shipped to other places for fertilizer as well. So that's historically what happened to these, these herds of buffalo on the prairies. Um, Wiscana is the word in our language, it actually means pile of bones, that's actually Regina. Um, so there's actually there. And then the bottom, this is um, a Miskwichi Waskihigan or Edmonton, and you could start to see the fracturing off of the land as well. And so when we think about a flow of um, landscapes and also rivers, we can start to see that European model of commodification of the land um, came pretty early that really harmed there. Um, what flowed with this was our treaty relationship with, um, with uh, the British Crown and eventually the Crown and Right of Canada and the province of Alberta and Saskatchewan as well. Um, so that's a treaty there as well. And so I wanted to put this up here because we also have this other conception of treaty with Tuscan. Um, I will save my Wetaskiwin jokes. Um, I, I grew up there um, and they're only good for people from central Alberta anyway. So, um, but uh, this is a legal principle. Um, when we think about this is how we live on the land together um, and non-human beings always formed a part of this as well. Because we talk about our treaty relationships. We had our pipe ceremonies there that were um, inviting um, the creator to come in and to be a part of that. And with that comes all of creation as well as our old woods tell us. Um, and so 
our, our revitalization approach that I see is constitutional kindness. Um, and that's a word I came up with when I was writing my dissertation. I don't know if it means anything or not, but it's a way to start to look at the land and to recognize um, that kinship relationship um, and having more of that wagotoen with our relations around us where we can be making sound decisions um, with them in mind, right? And then there's this other one you see here. This is a way that we have all these legal principles that I didn't talk about within Plains Cree law that really inform Treaty 6 as well. So there is intersocietal law that, um, that uh, non-Indigenous peoples can take up because it is part of your treaty obligations on this land here as well. Okay, so I'm going to stop it there. Really looking forward to any questions or comments that you have. So I say maga. Um, and yeah, again, thankful for this opportunity to speak and to be a part of this with Terry. Thank you so much, Darcy. That was beautiful, amazing, like always. I've heard you um, tell that story, the Buffalo story, a few times. And each time something different stuck with me. So um it's really you're a, a very amazing um storyteller so oh, thank, you. thank you for that <laughs> <laughs> um so i have a couple of questions before we move to the audience's questions so while i do that um if the audience uh, members would like to insert their questions in the q a um part um that would be great um, so Terry Lynn, um, I'm, I'm really interested in um, thinking about the relationship between indigenous laws and colonial um, laws and legal orders, right? And um, how, um, how revitalization should shape um, colonial laws and, and constitution, right? So, and I really um, admire Haida and the different strategies that Haida has been using to affirm um, your jurisdiction, your authority over the lands and waters. And at the same time, looking for spaces where you can also um, sign agreements, um, but also go into court. So a, a really big range of ways um, that you interact with the colonial um, state. Um, so uh, I, I'm interested in hearing from you if you could share with us um, what are the main challenges challenges in deciding about like which strategy best to use in order to um, affirm um, Haida jurisdiction over waters and lands? And a second question I think would be, because I think you mentioned that um, um, title um, regarding oceans is one of your major, major challenges right now. Um, if you could share a little bit about that as well. Sure, thank you. And um, before I answer, though, I did also want to thank Darcy. I loved to, your presentation, and I see a lot of linkages. Even though we are very different, come from very different traditions, there are a lot of similarities, and it was so enlightening to see. So thank you for sharing those stories. Um, so for the Haida, uh, I don't know if there would be a best strategy. And maybe the best strategy has been to use all strategies so that each one supports the other. And so one of the first strategies was uh, a, a blockade. And the elders don't like to use that word or the Haida don't like to use the word blockade, but rather it's the upholding of our laws. And so that was done in the early 1980s when we saw massive clear cuts and cutting of the last big old growth forest on Haida Gwaii. And it was at that time when the Haida realized that the line that they were drawing at Lyle Island was between them and the settler communities and third parties but actually we had already intertwined our roots in that our children were going to school together and learning from each other and intermarrying and that we had to begin reconciliation before it was ever a catchphrase in this country in the 1980s and finding ways to work together. And so from, from those early days of that blockade, 
actually in those early days, we built a longhouse in the Guayanas area and followed our laws of, ho of hosting a potlatch for, that are associated with the raising of a longhouse. And we invited the loggers to the feast uh, to start the process of reconciliation, to start seeing each of us as human beings, even though we held very different views and that we had to find a way together that would benefit all of us. And um, so all of our later um, efforts to uphold Haida laws on the land through direct action were different in that the settlers were seated with us and were also trying to find answers together and trying to reach consensus on the land use planning for Haida Gwaii to determine logging methods, rate of logging and where logging would occur, all of the big issues that we couldn't address before the Haida Nation case. This time the settlers were a key part of the land use planning that allowed us to get to some of those answers so that we were able to reshape the land base as I showed in the slide. Um, but there are limits to, to every tool. Uh, there were limits to how far we could go with those direct actions. Some of it required litigation, like the Haida Nation case, when we couldn't raise those big issues then it, and they were not, um, the governments didn't have a mandate to address strategic level issues like that. So the only recourse was to go to court in the Haida Nation case and other cases that we've brought to protect areas. Um, I think that Maybe a difference is that we took a step back when we created the constitution and grounded the mandate in Haida Gwaii itself, that that had to be the overriding priority. So while it's really important to have recognition of Haida title, it was that interim step of ensuring that there were forests for the future and that there were abalone and herring and all of these species for the next generations that took the main priority. And then we needed to find a tool that would allow for interim protection, would not compromise our sovereignty and jurisdiction and wouldn't um, see us recognizing crown sovereignty and jurisdiction, but finding a way to work together in the interim. So we've gone done direct action, litigation, direct action, negotiation, litigation, direct action, all of it rolled together and really finding whatever tool we can to uh, take us a step closer to the to fulfilling the ultimate um, constitutional mandate of the Haida Nation. Um, uh, also, Darcy was talking about how power coming from leaders. Another key attribute of the Haida Constitution is that the citizens and the people of the land hold the power. They are the ones that direct the people, and it's hardwired into the Constitution to ensure that our leaders, elected leaders, are actually. Uh, following, the wish, following the wishes of the people and taking care of Haida Gwaii. So what we have created is not perfect. We still need to go to court, even though we have these collaborative management regimes in place. Um, and that's the substance of the current negotiations is trying to find better ways to resolve disputes between us and third parties in the Crown. And that, that's the harder stuff to work through in negotiations. Um, but we still have this massive, large title case moving through the courts, increasing the pressure on all sides to try to reach some outcome in the interim. So while the land base isn't perfect, it's a good interim step. The harder part is oceans. Uh, there isn't really any precedent that we can rest upon for that. Uh, fish move. Our territory goes across international boundaries in the oceans. And all of those things make it a lot harder to reach an agreement or to conclude to reach a resolution in the title case. So again, we're trying those strategies of negotiating with the government of Canada for ocean spaces and recognition of title to ocean spaces at the same time as um, advancing the title case and focusing on marine spaces, but also through the collaborative management process, working together to really build up our knowledge base of all of those stat statistics, I mean, I did only shared a small part of them, but about the uniqueness of the ocean territories has been brought to light through the collaborative management and the focus study that comes from national protected areas and national marine conservation areas. Um, and of course, with all of that is important, is important to integrate Haida knowledge. It's not just scientific or environmental knowledge, but Haida knowledge about um, uh, building up our knowledge base for how to to help guide better decisions in either negotiations or litigation. And I'm sorry, that was a long answer. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, 
sorry, I'm mute. That was a great answer. Thank you so much. Um, Darcy, would you like to speak to that? I know you're um, in a very different context with Treaty 6, but um, um, do you, how do you think like strategies of this relationship uh, between indigenous law and, and the colonial yeah. state? Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll think about it specifically to Treaty 6, because it does provide a different frame. And it's, um, there's, there's a lot of difficulties in terms of just the historical suppression of, um, of legal traditions in the prairies. And so I think there is one, um, a lot of that decenteredness that occurred. Um, so these stories are told, um, there might be some practice of laws, for example, when people hunt, but it wasn't necessarily out there that we're going to assert this as, as our laws. The second part is just this ingrown, um, the challenge of having the pattern, especially the Indian Act patterning legal lives here in the prairies as well. And so finding a way to get out from under the Indian Act is what you hear a lot of people talk about in the prairies. And then at the same time, having this revitalization of these traditions. And so we're, we're really in, in, in that aspect. So one, um, the strategy that um, Terry Lynn talked about is like knowledge increase, um, knowledge growth in communities, I think is one. Um, and what, what comes with that is kind of like a decentered approach because we have a number of Indian Act First Nations that are Cree or Cree mixed across Southern Saskatchewan, um, Central Alberta, Central Saskatchewan, is that sort of localized revitalization of law that we're seeing. We're seeing constitutions flowing out of, like written constitutions flowing out of First Nations um, to where we can have some sort of like, again, re that fabric. And then there can be this sort of cohesion at um, organizational levels that we have. The litigation, it's, it's really tough um, because of um, uh, historical Canadian interpretations of treaty sex. It's really difficult mm -hmm. to, um, to raise even Indigenous laws as well, um, because we had not only have, um, you know, the treaties were negotiated, the main parts of them over two events that took four days each in 1877 which is just mind blowing when you think about the landmass that was um, purportedly exchanged there, according to the Crown. Um, and it was written in a document that we, you know, I could have read all the text um, in, in my presentation instead of right that, that encompasses there. So the interpretation has been one-sided for a number of years. And so um, in court, it's, it's really difficult to move away from that, right? Um, mm -hmm. So that's the challenge there. So it really is decentered, rising up. I and mean, where I think we'll see the movement is that kind of like political, you know, um, also relationship with, non-Indigenous peoples. And so um, I, I loved hearing Terry Lynn talk about that um, just in her answer. And here we're actually seeing it with the revitalization of, um, of lands that are moving beyond, you know, farming on the prairie scape, but actually a revitalization of, of landscapes and waterscapes that are used for more historical purposes, including for Buffalo as well. And there's a lot of non-Indigenous peoples, organizations, groups who are joining in with the way we think about Indigenous law in, in thinking about this as well. And so I think there's, it's, it's very, just by the nature of colonization, um, it's very grassroots here, yeah, to, mm -hmm. to answer your question. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, I just I, wanted to jump in and offer another sure. comment that we have in common, and that is that the importance of language to laws and the revitalization of it, it's so important. In the Haida Nation, we have less than 20 fluent speakers. It's critically endangered as assessed by the UN. So it really is a race against time to um, to learn the language. I'm not a fluent speaker, but it, it is incredible the insights that come from the language, like the um, translation of responsibility and how that's tied to our whole conception of our existence in the world. So I think that that will be continued work of all Indigenous scholars is turning back to our languages uh, and to find out more knowledge about the to help revitalize Indigenous laws. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. That's a very important aspect. Thank you, Terry Lynn. Um, I was also thinking, Darcy, um, when you speak about the animacy of the land and the beings of the land, right? And you, you write in one of your pieces about um, uh, 
the beings being inspirited and they have agency um, and how that shapes law. Um, and it, it struck me that when you spoke about the, the stone, is it the buff buffalo stone? Uh, that was, um, now it's, it's drowned, it's under the artificial lake um, that was dammed. And how, um, how do you see this, these important places? And, and we hear a lot about like burial sites uh, just being um, devastated by dams and other so important places for um, indigenous peoples and how that affect law for, for you and for, for Plains Creed people? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, and I mean, it, it interrupts it, right, is, is, is a large thing. So I think about that idea of Kyogoin or Kyotoin, it depends on some language speakers speak it differently, of visiting and how that is actually like a foundational legal principle that you wouldn't necessarily see in, in the common law. Um, is for that, right? Is, so I can, we can share stories about the animacy of the land. And some of this is, you know, some might say this is fantastical when you talk about a stone. If I told you that whole story that turns into a boy or was, was a boy that turned into that stone. Um, but it's going to those places and hearing those stories, touching those stones um, that makes that sort of animacy, how we think about it, um, to start to, to understand it. And, and so one way when you think about stones in our ceremonies, um, our asani, uh, um, we use them for in our sweat lodge ceremonies is we heat those up and um, we go into the sweat. And um, and if you don't believe in the animacy of rocks before then, um, you will in a very hot lodge, right? It's 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 hot and it's healing and those things. And so so again, I, I can I can describe this to people who haven't never done a sweat, um, and you can even imagine it. I can be descriptive, and then you go into there as well, and then you can start to think about how our relationship with those things that we think about is so as inanimate is there. And so that's why it's important. Yeah. So that point that you raise about um, you know subsumed in water and not being able to visit and even just when we think about um the 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 news out of Kamloops that Terry Lynn pointed to as well is is that's all part of our our, our own sort of constitutive nature is that we still have our relationships with those our ancestors who've passed even physically and those as well and, and so that's that's a part of this that we we have to be able to go to these sites to understand that animacy we hear stories um, we have, we create new ones on them because we have our, our relationship. Um, so that Buffalo Lake story, every time I tell it, I remember where I heard it and it was in my dad's Thunderbird car. That was this huge boat and it was my brother telling me and it was winter time as well. And that's a part of that story for me as well. Right. So law is always growing. It's not just in that story. We're always adding to it. And, and, um, so that's when we think about um, animacy. So the second part of this is, is I also like how when we talk about animacy, it leads us to that, like, that dark point of like, well, what is animacy? Like, what does it mean? And it actually goes back to this question about legal personhood, right? That like, once we say something has personhood, what does that mean? Right? And I think I like mm -hmm. to think about animacy in that way. Mm -hmm. So I'll leave that out there. I'll put that out there as a floater. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's actually, um, one of the questions we have here, um, so if you could please define what legal personhood is. I don't know if he means like in general or what you, Terry Lynn and Darcy understand by legal personhood. It sounds like a question the moderator should answer with the, no, I'm just <laughs> I mean, I could, yeah, so there is, so that, I mean, I kind of like, yeah, it's a, that's the question, right, is what legal personhood is. Um, so there's one way I'll, I'll give the, I don't know what, what the coaching of the, the position is, so sorry for the person who asked this question if I'm just repeating what you already know, but um, the one is when we think about this move um, from a common law perspective of property and um, non-human rights, um, legal personhood is attaching some sort of right that we'd see within people, um, for example, in trees, rivers, right? So we know that. Um, so that Magpie River, well, that was the part of the last one here, for example, 
um, the municipality talked about the right to flow, to regenerate, and giving those rights. And so um, that's when we talk about personhood. How I treble it um, from a Plains Creary perspective is that um, we know that um, even when we talk, we have kinship, for example, with Mustas, with Buffalo, we know they're Buffalo, right? Um, and it's not, if I'm thinking of them as people, it's taking away from their buffaloness or their their mustusness. I don't know how to say that in our language. Um, and what that's doing is I may think that because I'm giving it these human rights that are protecting it, that I'm probably taking something away from that as well, right? And so that's where I trouble this conception. Um, also, just the who's interpreting these rights is an important one as well, right? Um, or is it a human interpretation? And, and what mm -hmm. does that bring when we think about personhood? And then the final thing is, this is the classic thing is like, I can, um, I don't know what you have in your room there, Rebecca, because you have there, but let's say you have a picture on your wall. And then I'm gonna like, I'm gonna give that picture rights now, right? I'm gonna give that picture uh, personhood rights. The moment I do that, I'm also opening up the possibility that because I'm the authority giving it that right, that I can, do something that's going to take away those rights as well. And I think that's something mm -hmm. that theoretically, when we start to think about personhood from that sort of liberal perspective becomes, I think, somewhat troubling from a Plains Cree perspective when we think about what we'll go to and in relationships that mm -hmm. maybe keep that relationship more honest. But mm -hmm. so open theoretical questions. I'm going to stop talking about it though. Maybe Terry Lynn has. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Terry Lynn also uh, pointed to um, that the, this concept is not uncontested, right? It's, um, and we need to problematize that. What, do you have any thoughts on that, Terry Lynn? Yeah. Um, I uh, agree with Darcy's points. Those are really great considerations. Um, my objection, I wouldn't call it an objection, but my worry about legal personhood, for instance, if we were to do that to Haida Gwaii, um, is that very issue of uh, who those rights would go to. I, I like this, I love the height of view that there are already caretakers built in and those should be given some sort of recognition, maybe not necessarily rights. The conception of Haida Gwaii with Kuya Gagandals having a responsibility to hold up Haida Gwaii instead of an obligation, instead of being a loser like Atlas and holding up the world, he's the victor, he's the one that had the responsibility of holding up. So I worry about that part of rights as being an obligation. Instead, I like the idea of responsibilities instead. And I think that if we were to recognize supernatural beings, uh, then that would help um, that divide better. Um, I think that so I, I have a book called Out of Consumer Female Supernatural Beings of Haida Gwaii. And as I was working and speaking to publishers, one of the publishers said, to use your phrase, Darcy, we don't publish fantasy. And so the idea was that supernatural beings was fantastical and therefore they didn't want anything to do with it. And that becomes a problem too if you are shifting from legal personhood to supernatural beings and people think it is fantasy and not something that can actually be real. But yet you look at corporations, corporations are a legal fictionhood, they're a myth that grounds the entire Western legal system. And therefore, why couldn't supernatural beings also be conceived of as something that will take care of the, um, our existence through our reciprocal relationship with them? Mm -hmm. Oh, I think you're muted, Rebecca. Oh, you're still muted. I can see you're a little bit. Oh, okay. There you go. Sorry. Uh, that's fascinating, Terry Lynn. Thank you so much. That's amazing. Um, there's another question here, and um, I think it relates to what you were speaking about, Darcy, about the relationships between the Plains Cree and Blackfoot and other nations. Um, so the question is, are there territories where jurisdictions overlap as between indigenous peoples? If so, how are those overlaps dealt with among the nations, I suppose? 
Yeah, I mean, I can talk a little bit about those relationships because um, here we have, uh, so from Plains Cree, historically, there's a number of, of different relationships where we actually had alliances with some Indigenous nations like um, Stony Peoples, uh, where we actually shared um, territories and in, in traveling. We also um, had historical practices of, of seasonality, right, of following buffalo. And so part of that was shared in there. And then our historical relationship with the Nitsitapi was more, at times it was adversarial, but it was more of that kind of structure that maybe the Western world knows a little bit more about of like actual territory as well. And um, how those were negotiated was through protocols, treaties, um, much like we see within legal traditions now, right? Um, so not necessarily written, but we have those, those stories of landscapes, we're actually telling treaty stories. And so um, the story, I grew up in Wetaskiwin, the town, and it's actually based on this historical treaty uh, between Blackfoot and Cree and the story of coming to that as well, right? And so that was reproduced in order to share the law of, of our relationships there. So um, so that, that's an interesting one. There's also, I've read, and so this is out of my, my personal knowledge, that the Nitsitapi and the uh, Kootenai so the people in, in kind of when you go to the Rocky Mountains, they actually shared territory through ceremonies involving deer as well and hunting as well. And so you can start to see other legal traditions having like land, animals, informing how you're going to share territories as well, right? Um, so, um, so really great to think beyond this kind of... Um, Westphalian sovereignty model that really gets placed on Indigenous nations that we have older historical relationships that we, mm -hmm. we practiced, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Terry Lynn, would you have um, something to say about like the overlapping of jurisdictions? Do you, do you experience that um, in the Haida territory? And then a follow up question that I think it relates to that someone else asked um, how can we think ideas of geopolitical boundaries in relation to those responsibilities um, to water in collaborative governance? All right. Um, we do have overlapping territories, but our overlap is in the ocean spaces. And so the Haida have negotiated what we call treaties of respect between the nations about how those areas will be shared and how they will be governed. And we had a, a beautiful um, treaty signing ceremony with the um, Hilsuk nation a few years ago. And then we've shared knowledge between us and shared trees to make totem poles. So it, it has been a really good revitalization of that ancient relationship. Much of those ancient relationships would have been documented in uh, shared songs, shared dances, like the gifting of songs and dances, the gifting of woven robes, uh, the gifting of carved boxes, all of those historic relationships are embodied in beautiful pieces of art like that. And so our work today, given that we're in a battle for recognition of our title and our rights is um, to revitalize those relationships given the impact that colonization has had on it. I think the greatest problem that we face in Aboriginal law is this idea of exclusive use and occupation, which is an aspect of Aboriginal title. And yet it's foreign to us as Indigenous peoples, um, especially if you don't view uh, you don't have this idea that you own the land and sea, but rather that you are in a relationship with the land and sea that makes it difficult. And then that exclusive use and occupation has an impact on geopolitical boundaries, which again are, um, are a construct that, uh, uh, that comes from Western law and not necessarily mm -hmm. Indigenous laws. It, it has come to bear um, with us with um, uh, the US bound border and our sharing and our crossing often between that boundary. But um, um, there has been some scholarship though that has looked at how collaborative management can create boundaries of recognition for indigenous peoples that I see also applying to marine use planning. So if we're starting to create zones that we're going to collaboratively manage, that is recognition of Haida jurisdiction and sovereignty over those areas that can help us. Um, ocean spaces are very hard to govern and even the law of the sea has resulted in very fragmented management of ocean spaces. And I think that collaborative management can help 
understand those spaces better, to can, um, increase our knowledge of those spaces and the threats and challenges that are with them. So I think that collaborative management is a good first step, although we really do need to be, it needs to be truly collaborative. It can't just um, be consulting or involving an Indigenous nation. The Indigenous nation must be in the driver's seat um, and choosing the relationships for how the, the, the land and sea and rivers will be governed and, and managed. Um. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, so I have a question for Darcy specifically here. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, Jennifer says, I have a question for Darcy. Could you elaborate a bit more on the differences you see between Wakatawin, did I pronounce it right? And the term jurisdiction. Yeah, so great question. I pronounce it wrong all the time too, and I'm saying it because I always forget the. I doubt it. <laughs> I always just go well, go to win, uh, and I, people get mad at me because I don't say well, go to win. It has a. Oh, um, uh, yeah, and I really, uh, I really love Terry all of Terry Lynn's answers, but that talking about um, geopolitical, and and I think about so I'm, I'll get to this question, but um, the the you know. Quite frankly, here in Alberta is there's just been no room that's been given for Indigenous nations to be a part of water management schemes. And, and so that's more of a non-Indigenous problem that um, is Indigenous people are facing the brunt of it. And so um, there's an easy answer there because it's not for lack of trying or there. There just needs to be that room and it needs to, we need to reverse centuries of, of practices by government organizations here. So. Um, to be quite frank um, about that. Um, but yeah, the difference between what go to win and jurisdiction, I mean, there's, there's what go to win is um, it's, it's like this really high arching principle when we think about um, Plains Curry law governance and constitutionalism um, that really informs a lot of different areas. There's lots to be interpreted when we think about what go to win, but how it informs jurisdiction. So I wouldn't say it replaces it. Um, but it informs how you think about, well, what's, what are we thinking about jurisdiction? We're thinking about what is our legal relationships to a place if we take it away from the sort of hierarchy, right? And how a go-to-win informs our legal relationships is it actually brings in that language of relationships, obligations, responsibilities um, into there instead of just being like, protection of a right that we often see. Um, so, so I wouldn't say like there's this like cookie cutter difference that we can see, but what we see is this flowing of um, different orientations that can really inform how we live on a place, if that makes sense to answer there. So I know that's not satisfying, but that actually ties back into the geopolitical because if, for example, Plains Cree people were given jurisdiction over the North Saskatchewan River between a and B, we'd actually see well, go to win being on the ground implemented in, in that sort of river management, right? And so while mm -hmm. we're still in that process of revigorating things with we'll go to win is because of this geopolitical question, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, there are also questions here about, um, and that, that that's amazing that we can, um, Give more space for you to speak more about the animacy aspect and the supernatural being. So people are asking if there is a parallel there between the two, the idea of animacy and the idea of supernatural beings. Um, and then I would go further if you want to speak a little bit more how that shape um, law and legal orders and also how do you see that um, integrated or influencing um, settlers law. So if Terry Lynn wants to go first. <laughs> All right, <laughs> I'll go first this time. <laughs> uh, I actually, I think they are quite similar. I, I may not completely understand um, animacy, but I think it's similar in that our view is that every being has a spirit and um, 
I, I guess I would say like people, our actual translation is like salmon people and herring people and ocean peoples and forest people. So we add the word people into it, but I think that's common to many indigenous nations. Our word for Haida actually means people in our language. So it's just that the supernatural beings are the ones who take care of all of the other people. And there's greater beings and they're greater because they have greater responsibilities, not because of being greater in size or having greater power. So I think they're similar in that way. Um, and I guess um, I would, li would like to see a shift from obligations to responsibilities. That's the greatest thing that I think the supernatural beings would bring. Uh, and um, as for how to integrate what, how we made our, uh, the sort of five or six foundational laws to bear, but we, how we brought it to bear to management of land and sea was linking it with ecosystem-based management principles. So then um, settler managers, it, it provides a portal to their understanding our laws. It's not an exact match, but it was one way to we're actually integrating settler law, but actually we're upholding Haida law and it's just a common ground for us to stand on and, and realize that, um, that there, is a, there should be a better way of managing human use of land and sea through integrating these laws in a, in a bigger way. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah, that's, that's great. Um, I think that that also uh, relates to the idea of legal personhood, right? If you think of, we, we need to constantly find, um, which is kind of, it can be a little frustrating. You keep finding Western language and Western tools that can match a little bit of some of the aspects of uh, indigenous legal orders mm -hmm. so that they, they can be implemented one day. But maybe that's, um, just a, a path that needs to be taken and, and so change can, can, can actually happen, right? Would you like to speak a little bit about that, Darcy? The yeah. animacy and supernatural? Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, there's ways that, uh, so I, I love hearing Terry Lynn talk about this because we have our different just traditions within indigenous nations and, um, we have, um, again, it's not within my knowledge about like certain supernatural beings over certain places, um, but that may exist within Plains Cree thinking as well. Um, but even just like there's a commonality when we think about like things having spirit and, and the word in our language is a chag. Um, and it is like really this idea that lots of different things have a spirit, right? And so it's animals, um, it's plants, those things. And, and with that, when we think about, once we recognize something has an achag or they're, they're bearing that, they have the, um, again, we, we, we're, we're inspirited beings, like in how we relate to each other, it changes there as well. So um, that's how I think about that. I really love the way Terry Lynn also talked about um, uh, corporations. And this is the one thing I, I think about is like a limited liability corporation um, as a legal fiction that you can escape retribution for the harm that you do just by saying it's just this is like that's something that I find even more fantastical than um, something that you have a relationship on the land with for um, since time immemorial right and so there is this ability for us to think as legal practitioners that things are reasonable even if they're not within our histories of finding it reasonable right so I, I love that example that Terry Lynn brought up as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, and um, I have to apologize to the audience. I won't be able to take any more questions just because um, we're um, over time. Um, but I would like to thank you, um, Terry Lynn and Darcy, and I would like to invite everyone to join me if possible in thanking them and um, it was the, both presentations and the discussion. I've learned so much and I really enjoyed them um, and it keeps me thinking of how we can, um, how we can 
be like respectful and also think of indigenous law as not just fantasies, as uh, Darcy was saying, not just myths and fiction. There are uh, real sources of law, those stories. And um, as Val Napoleon would uh, teach us as well, like uh, analyzing those stories is important and it is, um, it is part of what law is and legal orders. So thank you so much, Darcy and Terry Lynn. Um, so there will be further webinars um, to this series. Um, and so please stay tuned. This webinar is being recorded and it will be made available um, at the website, the Center for Constitutional Studies. Um, so just a, a quick reminder again, uh, again, there will be a short feedback form following the webinar um, sent to you. So if you could please, the audience could please answer that um, form. We really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much, Darcy. And thank you so much, Terlin. It was a pleasure um, listening to you. An amazing uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for your gracious hosting and questions. Thank you. Oh, thank you yeah, so much. Thank you, Rebecca. That was great. Thank, yeah. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have an amazing day. Bye-bye. Yeah,